Good day to you. Our guest today is Dr. Rupert Soar, of the CEO of uh, Freeform Construction uh, Proprietary Limited, uh, a company based in Nottingham in the UK. Uh, Rupert is a pioneer in uh, digital fabrication and rapid prototyping uh, technologies, and his company is dedicated to applying these t uh, techniques to the construction industry. So, welcome, Rupert. Uh, Hi, Scott. Let's uh, start off by uh, having you tell us a little bit about just what digital fabrication and rapid prototyping are and how that might relate to uh, construction. Digital fabrication, rapid prototyping, additive manufacturing, and many terms. Essentially, what we're trying to do is extract digital design and put it into the physical world. So, those processes that allow us to take complex shapes and forms and structures and then reproduce those and replicate those into consumer products or even buildings. Why do we need complex shapes and buildings then? Because what uh, com computer design has enabled us to do is to actually start to get into more complex structures. And when I say more complex, complexity normally implies that they, they have greater function. And, and, and a lot of what this is about is just squeezing more functionality into, into less space. So if we look at something like a mobile phone, the thing we come to love and admire about mobile phone design is that not only does it look neat and cute and smaller each time with each iteration, but actually gets better with more functions and more processes embodied within it. Okay, you're visiting us here at a College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and so what's the relevance of these kinds of methods to uh, our mission here, for example? It, un underlyingly, it's biology. Um, and so, you know, that, that gradual fascination or that drawing together where if we can use and exploit computers fully, we can actually pr start producing complex structures and structures of such great complexity and, and, and blistering function that we, we believe we can actually not only mimic biology, but potentially do biology within the objects that we make. Okay. Um, now, uh, uh, a buzzword that's uh, floating around right now, at, uh, not only in places like ours, but in the construction industry as well, is uh, sustainability. We're in the midst of a big sustainability uh, initiative, for example. Uh, so, so how do these uh, kinds of uh, computer-aided uh, methods and building design actually feed into this concept of sustainability? Sustainability is a, a very sticky word and has multiple uh, um, classifications and definitions for the term. Within architecture and construction as a, as a broad field, then we tend to fall into three kind of categories to it. The one I'd say the first uh, area of sustainability is, is the development and reliance on technologies or clean technologies that allow you to add technological solutions to existing designs or existing structures, for example. The second area is that of uh, materials and the, the shift from non-sustainable material use to materials with more rest uh, recyclable or reusable credit credentials attached to them. Both of those are essentially part of the process of construction and, and engineering, if you like, and, and none of them are really that part of the design phase itself. Where we get to an interesting point or convergence at this stage is the word sustainable architecture has been around for a long time, you know, since the 1950s. But essentially what we've seen is when people consider a sustainable architecture, we generally talk about passive ventilation systems, for example, large, tall atrium spaces and chimney effects that use convective heat flows and sources. What we don't have at the moment is architectures or designs of a building structure that allow it to, say, harvest energy from the environment that it's in. Right? And, and so there is this, if you like, another category that, that's left undone at the moment. So a criticism that is sometimes raised at architecture at the moment is that there is a, a sustainable architecture per se, but it's more of a reliance on the engineering expertise of material utilization and clean technology integration than it is, say, let's design this building and manipulate and fold its structure as nature does, as biology does, to actually achieve some greater effect. You mentioned that uh, part of this is, uh, is harvesting energy from the environment. Now, if I take a brick and I put it out in the sun, you can say that it harvests energy from the environment. And if I take a wall of bricks and I put them in the sun and put them into a building, uh, that's also harvesting energy from the environment. So what's the big deal about uh, doing this digitally? Why can't we just build brick walls? Brick, brick walls is, is such a great analogy. And, and the very 
construct of brick in your mind is one of a kind of impermeable barrier between an inside and an outside space. As we, most people will accept that nature doesn't kind of have brick walls, it doesn't have impermeable membranes. The other thing about you know, brick per se as a, as, a, as a unit volume is it's a minimal surface object. You know, between those corners there's, there's a surface stretched between them. So, so brick can store heat in terms of thermal mass, but, but what nature does with brick is it will begin to fold it and squeeze it and it'll produce an object of the same volumetric space but it'll actually stretch its surface unbelievably to incredible degrees of folding and surfacing and as soon as you do that then you start to increase say the convective flows and the performance of brick suddenly escalates. Now with digital fabrication technologies we're not limited to making bricks or indeed houses which are just large brick shapes these are, we can move to highly folded structures, to membranes and wall systems that, that breathe and work as biological systems do. So what does this have to do with sustainability, though? Well, sustainability is, as I say, is a, is a difficult word to actually uh, to categorize within this. But essentially, the, the key to this is if we are able to manage energy flows within and without a, a, a habitat that we create, essentially, what happens is we can start to em envision a, a, a process by which we extend the physiological functions of us, the living organism inside, into the very fabric of the wall that, of the building itself. And th this fundamentally changes the way that we perceive and how the building performs in, its, in, in, in actuality. So the building is sensitive and, and is actually generated within the environment that it is, and therefore has a greater sensitivity to the environment that it's, it's built within. So what these digital methods will do is it will actually enable a sort of a different kind of sustainability. You know, we're talking about more than just uh, having uh, recyclable materials or, or, or materials drawn from nature. You're actually uh, talking about building structures that mimic uh, living systems in, in a fairly profound way. Is that right? Yeah, uh, and I think the word mimic creeps into here inevitably because we're limited in vocabulary that we have in describing these things. I get classed, uh, and I know you do, as a, as a biomimicist. But what we're trying to do is actually move one stage beyond this. So biomimicry essentially tries to copy the forms that we see in nature, whether they're hooks of Velcro and things like this. What we have found, and I know that what you and I have particularly found by studying termites, is that we actually look at how the processes that in, are embodied within a structure, which in our case might be the wall of a termite mound, or indeed the wall of our home. And so the key becomes understanding how processes are embodied within a structure and suspended, if you like, as interacting processes and many intentions within that space. And we move towards something that is, goes beyond biomimicry to something that I know you coined, which is that of physiomimetics, the, the, the process of copying the processes that exist in nature itself. Okay, so you're really talking about making a building that is in a fairly profound sense uh, alive. You're not talking about just a structure that's sitting there. You're talking about something that is, uh, that is uh, interacting with the environment in the way uh, that, say, a lung would for an individual organism. Absolutely. Uh, and, and this gets interesting by current definitions of what is living and what isn't. Then I think that what we're describing would fall under the category of dead. But let's just zoom forward 10 years and we, and we have a better understanding of what life is. And, and from your own work here with homeostasis as a key component of what defines life, people will look back and say, oh, well, you know, buildings are more alive and maybe one day they could be classed as actually physically living. And, you know, the way in that you and I got into this uh, actual subject was by studying termite mounds themselves and actually looking how these physiological components of, of ventilation lead to structures that can regulate gas exchange between the inside and out. Okay. Thanks, Rupert. Pleasure. Mm -hmm.